my family are Christian missionaries. I said, I'm going to read the Quran and I'm going to find the mistakes in the Quran. I have one of the members of the family stab me with a knife on my left arm. I have a big scar over here. When you said you became a Muslim, yes. they did that? Yes, they did that. And I heard one of the family members say that you're not our daughter anymore. So I got this on. I took the phone and I called the 911, which is the police. And then the police came and he said, OK, you can come out, ma'am. I was all bleeding and scratched. Uh, I was beaten up really bad. And then when I came out and they saw me out, what happened? What happened? And I was like, please help. Help. And the police officer couldn't believe it. The second time they came and they put a knife on my neck and they said, you say Shahada. As a person, as a pastor's daughter to become a Muslim, it was very bad thing. They knew that the Sahaba were persecuted and they were killed because they became Muslims. And they told me, I'm going to kill you like, I, like the Sahaba were killed. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Ruba Kawar. Thank you for accepting our invitation. We are very happy to have you with us. I want to start with who is Ruba Kawar and can you tell us briefly about your life? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. My name is Ruba Kawar and I was born in April 30th, 1981 in Denmark. I come from a Christian background. My family are an evangelist and they are Christian missionaries and also they evangelize and try to bring the Muslims to Christianity. Back in 1985, we immigrated back to Jordan. This is where I come from. And my father decided to be a pastor in a church because my grandfather was the pastor of the church. So he took his place after he died. And we stayed there for 18 years. And in the process, he opened other three churches in Jordan. And in 2002, we had the immigration to come to United States of America. So I came here. And I was helping also my uncle, who was also a Baptist missionary and the pastor in an Arabic church in Dallas, Texas. And then after that, I finished my school, getting my degree in 3D modeling and animation for games. How was your life in regards to faith? What were you believing in? I was very religious because I was raised in a religious home. We were like living in a church because the first floor was the church. We were literally living on the second floor of the church. And so anything that happened in the church, we could hear it even upstairs because we have the microphones and, and everything. So we were like completely involved in the religious practices and all that. Alhamdulillah, I know all the Bible from the beginning until the end. I also studied many of the courses in the theology school and in the university. I was doing my master degree in theology and missiology means how to be a missionary, how to go and tell Muslims about Christ and about Christianity. Christianity. Can you tell us about your life as a Christian? SubhanAllah, I was just like a very devoted Christian. So we had Bible studies almost every day with the family. They call it the altar where the family get together and they, we sit and we read the Bible and we learn from it. When I was 12 years old, I became a teacher in the church. My father assigned me to be a Sunday school teacher for the children. And then while I was growing up, I started taking higher ages until I started also being a leader in the youth group. Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. We saw that 80% of our audience, including this video, are not subscribed to our channel. As you know, we are a non-profit organization and advertisements are disabled on our videos. So the only reason we are asking for this is to spread the truth. It may seem like a small act, but inshallah, it may be a means of guidance for many people. Now let's click the subscribe button and let's walk as an eternal passenger. When did you start questioning your faith? In 2004, after my father died, that was one of the things that it was a catastrophe for me. And I started thinking, why does God take the good people away like this? I was like his right hand. He was everything for me at the time, of course, with my mom. He left us with six kids and the youngest was seven years old. It was a very tough time, like financially and also like emotionally. We were left with no support. Where you were becoming aware of other religions, other belief systems. When I came to the United States to see all these people from different backgrounds and all these people from different 
races and different religions. Because I want to know as a Christian, how can I bring them to Christianity? And I started learning about other religions until finally when I was in college, they had a called International Day where everyone dressed up like international of their country and they have music. I went there and then I found some Muslims there and I got to know them and we started being friends. There are some Jews, but mostly Sunni. I wanted to bring them to Christianity, telling them to come to church, to read the Bible. They were asking me some questions like, for example, what did Jesus say in the Bible that he's God? So I tell them, oh, he said it so many times. The father and I are one. Whoever saw me saw the father. So I knew the answer is because this is how I was programmed on to answer on these questions. And then they say, well, how can Jesus die for our sins? I would just answer them because the way I was trained to be answered. But when I go home, I start thinking like, okay, you know what? What they're asking me is really makes sense. I really need to understand, am I really teaching and preaching what I really believe in or does it really make any sense? So I decided I wanted to go and read the Bible again. I started reading the Bible and I was shocked that not even one time he never said, I am God or come and worship me. He never asked anyone to come and worship. So why are we as Christians worshiping Jesus? And I couldn't find the answer. I asked God for guidance and uh, it took some months to do that. It wasn't something easy that I did until finally Jesus says in John 73, he says, this is the eternal lie to know you, the father, as you are the only one God and Jesus Christ that you have sent as you are the only one God to be worshiped. So he's saying that la ilaha illallah, that there is no God, but Allah, he's saying the Shahada. I said, you know what? I believe in one God. I believe that Jesus is sent from God. I'm going to follow the footsteps of Jesus, but that's about it. Okay. So that's what I did. I said, I'm going to read the Quran and I'm going to find the mistakes in the Quran and show them the contradictions. They try to say that my Bible, that it is corrupted, that it is, you know, that has a lot of mistakes. I'm going to show them that they had the mistakes. Because when I read the Bible, the four Gospels, I start to see the contradictions. I start to see the differences. It doesn't really show what is the truth in here. I studied the theology and they teach you in the theology that there are at least 5% of the Bible that has been changed. They teach us this in the church, but no one pays attention. No one really cares because they think that the Bible is just a spiritual guide for them that lead them to the truth through the spirit. The words on the papers and on the Bible, this is not really important. What important is how you connect with God. It's all emotional. So I started reading the Al-Baqarah and then Al-Imran. I got so connected to it because it talks a lot about Jesus. And that's something that I'm like, you know what? If Jesus wasn't in the Quran, I probably never believed in the Quran or in Islam. But that was something that really connected me to the Quran was like, I wanted to know where Jesus is in the Quran. So I finished Al-Imran and then I got to Al-Ma'idah. And every day I read about the Quran, I feel something different. I feel something changes in me. I feel so much connection. Every time I want to put the Quran down and say, okay, I'm not going to read it. Something brings me back to it. And I want to read more. I want to know what Allah says. And I, it just felt so much sense. And it's like when Jesus say, when he was a baby, he say, Inni Abdullah, I am the servant of Allah. So he doesn't say I am God. So he just answered my question. And then I kept reading it until finally I got to Surat Al-Ma'idah. The next ayah says, and if they hear what it has ever revealed from the messenger of Allah, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you will see their eyes overflowing with tears. And I start crying at that time. And alhamdulillah, that was the turning point for her. And I said, oh Allah, I want to believe. I want the truth. And I saw my friends. I said, listen, I want to become a Muslim. So my friends look at me, they're like, you're crazy. What? Just two months ago, you told me that you will never become a Muslim. You will not do this and that. And he said, even if you die, you're going to die as a Christian. What's really changed? And I said, uh, this is what happened to me. So I told them the story. And they start crying and they said, subhanAllah, Allah loves you. And I said, why do you say that? He said, 
tomorrow, the first day of Ramadan, on the first night of Ramadan, I became Muslim. I, I didn't know what to do. I was so happy. At the same time, I was so emotional. I wanted to scream and tell everyone that I was a Muslim. How was your family's reaction? Can you tell us about those moments? It was devastating. It was a shock for them. So for them, as a person, as a pastor's daughter, become a Muslim, it was very bad thing. So I got this on. I was physically abused. I have one of the members of the family stabbed me with a knife on my left arm. I have a big scar over here. When you said you became a Muslim, yeah. they did that? Yes, they did that. I was hit with a big crystal vase on the back of my head. I still have a scar over there that I bled, almost went to the emergency room because of this. I was all bleeding and scratched. I was beaten up really bad because of this. And I was in America. There was not in an Arab country until I passed out at that time because I was beating up really bad for like probably two hours. I woke up, I was on the couch and I heard one of the family members saying that I did this because I love you. You're doing wrong. And of course, they just me. You're not our daughter anymore. You're not our sisters anymore. We don't want you anymore. And so on. And I closed the door and I was crying so hard. I didn't know what to do. And then I got up to see myself with the mirror. I have a black eye. I was beaten up. I was like all bleeding. I didn't know where the blood coming from. It was like coming from my neck. They took everything from me. They took my phone, they locked the door, they didn't want me to get out. And then suddenly I saw a phone on the sink. I was trying to escape. I took the phone and I called the 911, which is the police. The police came after five minutes. I couldn't even talk. I was like choking because they choked me to death until I actually passed out. And I was like, help. And they thought that I have an asthma or something in the beginning. But then when they heard one of the people is screaming behind the door, telling me to open the door and knocking really hard, they knew that I was in trouble. So they got that address and then the police came and he said, okay, you can come out, ma'am. And then when I came out and they saw me, I was like, what happened? What happened? So they took me outside. They gave me some water to drink. And then I told them it's because I became Muslim. And the police officer couldn't believe it. Like he is not a Muslim, but he could not believe what he sees. Like it's not something normal to see in America because somebody changes their religion, they do that, you know, like it's So he said, you know what? You're old enough and you can do whatever you want. No one can tell you what to worship and what to do. That's what the police say. And it was like a message also from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like, it's time to go. Let this be kind me. It was very hard. No one helped me, so I had to go back to the house. The police came three times to my bowl. They get me out. So you called them again? Yes, because they threatened me of killing. The second time they came and they put a knife on my neck and they said, you say shahada, let me kill you like they killed them, the sahaba. At the time, I have some family members, they knew about Islam more than what I knew. They knew that the sahaba were persecuted and they were killed because they became Muslim. And they told me, I'm going to kill you like the Sahaba were killed. When I first came out, I told them, I'm a Muslim, deal with it, whatever. I didn't take it easy. I know some new Muslims in Jordan and in Syria. I know them personally. They have been Muslims for 10 years until now in secret because they know that this is what they're going to end up with. Physically, Abim is probably killed too. And we have a lot of sisters in Jordan that they were killed, literally killed because they became Muslim. And they call it what? Honor crimes. They say, oh, she ran away with a Muslim. So we're going to wash her blood by killing. Wallahi, I'm telling you the truth. Where does this hostility come from? It's cultural. We have a village in or a city in Jordan. We don't even have one mosque in it. And they're all Christians. And they're proud of it because they believe that, oh, we're the Christian Arabs. We come from a lineage that when the Muslims came and they opened the country, and they told us you become Muslim or they pay the jizya. We were the one who were rich. All these other Muslims, they were poor and they were forced to become a Muslim. They couldn't pay the jizya and that's why they became Muslim. Although in reality, and that's a misconception, and the jizya is like a tax you pay for the government to protect you. To protect you from who? From the Roman Empire, from Persians at the time. And the zakah, by the way, is higher than the jizya. The jizya was very, very small amount. SubhanAllah. So they're, they're proud. They're like, okay, our identity are the Christians. After five years of my Islam, although Alhamdulillah, I do da'wah, once I got into the airport, they took me to jail. And I asked them, why did you do that? Although it's an Islamic country, they say, oh, because you became a Muslim and that's a protection procedure for you. Unfortunately, we don't have a system in Jordan where it supports the, the new Muslims at the birth. 
And then when I got the, out of jail, the guy who was supposed to be marrying me, he left me alone. I didn't have no place to go. I didn't have any friends. I don't know anyone. And at the same time, and like I went through a lot of depression that they put some plot against me and they said to the Muslims that I am a person that I would go and tell the Christians who are hiding their Islam to their parents so they can get killed or they can be taken away from their community. So I had this big propaganda around me, people saying about me bad things that I am a spy from the church in the Muslims community. I am an American citizen. That means I'm an FBI or CIA trying to be among the Muslim community, you know, saying that the Muslims are not supporting you. That actually destroyed me completely. I was helping my family. I started relearning to be happy. And I thought that, oh, this is happiness for See, I wasn't really focusing on Allah. I was focusing on myself. Now, after I became Muslim, I was kicked out of the masjid while I'm praying. And they say, you don't deserve to pray over here. And I have another sister. She doesn't even know me. She came and she defended me. And she said, you know what? Until you see the soul coming out of her throat, then you would say that she's a kafir. But as long as you see her as a Muslim and she repented to Allah, you have no right to tell my left to come and pray in this. So you have this mentality of some Muslims, they say that, oh, because you left Islam, that means that there is no way around to go back. And this is a message for every person that they have doubts about Islam or they left Islam or they stop praying. Allah always have his doors open for you and you always will come to come back. Always. And after two years, uh, I got an invitation to go down to Egypt and do a lectures about Christianity and Islam. And then I opened a non-profit organization, the refugees, first of all, helping them in development, giving them the food and shelter that they need. But at the same time, because we see a lot of Christian missionaries, they try to take them away from us. I feel that this is my role to be the guard and to protect these families from the Christianity at perfect Christians. So we do our parts as Muslims, helping those refugees instead of turning to the Christians for help. Well, first of all, they have to have education. Like the first thing that Muslims have to learn their own religion. So when Christians come, at least they would know how to answer. And if they don't know the answer, it's okay to say, I don't know, and get some help. Thank you, sister. And nice meeting you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.